Welcome back, I'm That Chemist. Today we're diving into the world of greenhouse gases to answer a critical question. Which chemical is the worst greenhouse gas? We'll explore several properties, global warming potential, and impact on the environment of several notorious greenhouse gases. So let's get started. Greenhouse gases are chemicals that absorb infrared radiation from the sun and trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. This process is known as the greenhouse effect, and it's vital for maintaining our planet's temperature. However, an excess of these gases can lead to global warming. For example, molecules such as CO2 are able to absorb infrared light. Chemists are able to capture the infrared spectrum that specific chemicals absorb. For example, the FTIR spectrum of carbon dioxide, CO2, shows significant absorption bands at 2,350 centimeters to the minus one, indicating its ability to trap infrared light. While CO2 is the most abundant greenhouse gas, there are others far more potent in their greenhouse effect. Let's take a look at some of the main greenhouse gases and their global warming potentials, which we'll list as GWP. GWP is a measure of how much heat a greenhouse gas traps in the atmosphere over a specific time period compared to CO2, which has a global warming potential of 1. Anytime I discuss a global warming potential in this video, I'm going to be mentioning the global warming potential over 100 years according to the AR6 from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Carbon dioxide has a global warming potential of 1, and the main sources are from fossil fuel combustion, deforestation, and industrial processes. Methane has a global warming potential of 28, and the main sources are emissions from agriculture, waste management, and fossil fuel extraction. The next most noteworthy one is nitrous oxide, which has a global warming potential of 273. The main sources of nitrous oxide are from agriculture, industrial activities, combustion of fossil fuels, and biomass. We also have chlorofluorocarbons, which are really bad ones. For example, one chlorofluorocarbon is R12, or Freon-12, which has a global warming potential of 11,200, which is absolutely insane. The sources of chlorofluorocarbon emissions are from refrigerants, aerosol propellants, and foam blowing agents. In contrast, we have hydrofluorocarbons, which have hydrogens instead of chlorines. One example is HFC-134A, or R-134A, which has a global warming potential of 1,530, which is still really high. The main emissions of this come from refrigerants, air conditioning, as well as insulating foams. The last one I want to mention here is sulfur hexafluoride, SF6. This one has a really high global warming potential of 25,200, and SF6 is used in electrical insulation, in the production of magnesium, and in electronics manufacturing. As you can see, there are a lot of different types of greenhouse gases, and this is only giving you a bit of a snapshot just to get you oriented. Climate change, driven by human activities, is reshaping our planet at an unprecedented pace. In recent decades, atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations have surged to levels unseen in hundreds of thousands of years. In 2023 alone, carbon dioxide levels reached 419 parts per million, methane soared to 1,920 parts per billion, and nitrous oxide peaked at 337 parts per billion. These emissions, primarily from burning fossil fuels, deforestation, and industrial activities, have led to a global temperature rise of approximately 1.45 plus or minus 0.12 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The consequences are profound and escalating. Reports from the IPCC highlight that without rapid, deep, and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, we face a future marked by intensified climate impacts from more frequent and severe heat waves to disruptions in global food supplies and rising sea levels threatening coastal communities. The stakes are really high. Mitigating climate change requires a comprehensive shift towards renewable energy sources and enhanced energy efficiency. The IPCC underscores that pathways limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius involve transitioning to low or zero carbon energy sources by mid-century, with substantial reductions in non-CO2 emissions such as methane and nitrous oxide. Every ton of carbon dioxide emitted adds to the cumulative global warming. To stay within a 1.5 degrees Celsius limit, we must adhere to a finite carbon budget. Achieving net zero emissions involves not only reducing emissions, but removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide removal technologies, including afforestation and direct air capture, play a crucial role in achieving negative emissions and stabilizing global temperatures. The IPCC states that if warming exceeds a specified level such as 1.5 degrees Celsius, it could gradually be reduced again by achieving and sustaining net negative global CO2 emissions. This would require deployment of carbon dioxide removal compared to pathways without overshoot, leading to greater feasibility and sustainability concerns. International cooperation is pivotal. 
the IPCC stresses the need for accelerated financial support and technology transfer to assist developing countries in their climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. Now that we've discussed the main concerns related to climate change, we can dive into some of these gases and understand why they're so impactful. CO2 is the most important greenhouse gas, so even though it has a low global warming potential, we're going to put it into S tier. S because we're screwed if we don't figure out how to get those levels back down to what they were pre-industrially. Next we have methane. Methane is a significant greenhouse gas with a global warming potential of 28, over 100 years. It is released during the production and transport of coal, oil, and natural gas. Methane is also emitted by livestock and other agricultural practices, as well as by decay of organic waste in municipal solid waste landfills. Overall, methane has a relatively low global warming potential, so we can put it into D tier, but it's still one of the gases that we need to really reduce emissions of if we're going to combat global warming. This next funky looking molecule is nitrous oxide. You might be familiar with nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is used as the gas for whipped cream, and it even has a sweet taste. Nitrous oxide with a global warming potential of 273 is primarily emitted from agricultural activities such as soil management practices, fossil fuel combustion, industrial processes, and biomass burning. Despite its relatively lower concentration in the atmosphere, its high global warming potential makes it a potent greenhouse gas. Nitrous oxide is definitely worse than methane, so we can put it right into C tier. You might be surprised to hear that water is a greenhouse gas. Water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas in the Earth's atmosphere, being responsible for 41-67% to 67 of the natural greenhouse effect. Unlike other greenhouse gases, its concentration is highly variable and is directly influenced by the temperature. As global temperatures rise due to increased concentrations of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, the atmosphere can hold more water vapor, which in turn amplifies the greenhouse effect through a positive feedback loop. This means that even though water vapor is not directly controlled by human activities, its role in global warming is significant. The concern with water vapor lies in its ability to enhance the warming initiated by other greenhouse gases, leading to more intense and prolonged climate changes. Fortunately, water has a very short lifetime in the atmosphere because of the water cycle, but it does still play a role in the greenhouse effect. So for that reason, we'll put it into D tier with methane just due to its sheer significance. This next molecule has three oxygens and it's called ozone. Ozone is a significant greenhouse gas with notable prevalence in the Earth's atmosphere, particularly in the stratosphere where it forms the ozone layer. This layer is crucial for absorbing the majority of the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation, thereby protecting life on Earth. However, ozone at ground level, or tropospheric ozone, is a result of photochemical reactions involving pollutants such as nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, typically from vehicle emissions and industrial activities. This tropospheric ozone acts as a potent greenhouse gas, contributing to global warming and exacerbating climate change. The increase in ozone concentrations at ground level not only impact climate change, but also poses severe health risks, including respiratory problems and other related illnesses. Therefore, while ozone plays a protective role in the stratosphere, its presence in the troposphere is a significant environmental concern due to its contribution to global warming and its adverse effects on human health. Overall, since it's formed by nitrogen oxides, we can put it with nitrous oxide, right into C tier. Next we have the really guilty molecules, chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons. CFCs and HFCs have very high global warming potentials. These gases were commonly used in refrigeration, air conditioning, and as propellants in aerosol sprays. Although many CFCs have been phased out due to their role in ozone depletion, HFCs have replaced them, continuing to contribute significantly to global warming. Ozone depletion is a separate process from global warming, but oftentimes people get them confused. Ozone depletion occurs when the ozone molecules in the stratosphere are depleted by radicals such as the chlorine radicals which can form photochemically from chlorofluorocarbons. There are other sources of ozone depleters aside from chlorofluorocarbons, but this is the easiest type to illustrate. This topic honestly deserves a video of its own. Freon-12, also known as R12, dichlorodifluoromethane, is a chlorofluorocarbon that was widely used as a refrigerant in air conditioning and refrigeration systems for many decades. Due to its high ozone depleting potential, R12 played a significant role in the depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer, leading to its phase out under the Montreal Protocol. It also has a high global warming potential of 11,200. This is insanely high, so this can go right into A tier. Because of the concerns related to it, R134A, 1112-tetrafluoroethane, a hydrofluorocarbon, emerged as a substitute for R12. 
While R134A addressed the issue of ozone depletion, it has a high global warming potential of 1,530, contributing significantly to climate change. It's not as bad as R12, so we can put it into B tier. In recent years, the industry has transitioned towards HFOs, such as HFO1234YF, tetrafluoropropene, a hydrofluoroolefin with a much lower global warming potential. In fact, its global warming potential is reported to be less than 1. This means that it's able to mitigate its environmental impact while still maintaining the ability to be a good refrigerant. HFO1234YF, this is great, it can go right into F tier, it is not a significant greenhouse gas. Now let's get to some of the worst ones, perfluorocarbons, such as carbon tetrafluoride. Perfluorocarbons, such as carbon tetrafluoride, have become a significant concern in the context of global warming. These compounds are predominantly used in the electronics industry, particularly in the manufacturing of semiconductors, where they serve as cleaning and etching agents. The high stability of PFCs results in extremely long atmospheric lifetimes, with CF4 persisting for about 50,000 years. This stability, combined with their ability to absorb infrared radiation, contributes to their high global warming potential. For instance, CF4 has a global warming potential of 7,380 over a 100-year period, making it far more potent than carbon dioxide. The accumulation of perfluorocarbons in the atmosphere, despite their relatively low emission volumes, poses a substantial risk to climate change mitigation efforts due to their long-term impact on the Earth's radiative balance. Carbon tetrafluoride, you're about as bad as R12, plus you last in the atmosphere 50,000 years. Right into A tier. You might be surprised to see a nitrogen bonded to a fluorine. This is nitrogen trifluoride. Nitrogen trifluoride has seen increasing use in the electronics industry, particularly in the manufacture of semiconductors and flat panel displays. While nitrogen trifluoride is less prevalent in the atmosphere compared to other greenhouse gases, its use is growing due to the expansion of electronic device production. Concerns about nitrogen trifluoride stem from its high global warming potential, which is 17,400 times that of CO2 over a 100 year period. This is insanely high. Despite being a potent greenhouse gas, its current atmospheric concentration is relatively low. However, as production and usage continue to rise, there is a significant concern over its potential impact on global warming if not properly managed and regulated. Nitrogen trifluoride, you can go right into S tier. The last significant one for this video is sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride is one of the most potent greenhouse gases that exists, with a global warming potential of 25,200. It's used in the electrical industry as an insulator and in the production of magnesium. There are alternatives that can be used in magnesium refining that are also a lot safer than sulfur hexafluoride, so it really shouldn't be used except for where absolutely necessary. Despite its relatively low emissions, its extreme potency makes it a significant contributor to global warming. So for that reason, sulfur hexafluoride can go right into S tier, which is appropriate. S for sulfur. We also have this interesting fusion of carbon tetrafluoride and sulfur hexafluoride, and this is believed to form through industrial processes involving sulfur hexafluoride and carbon tetrafluoride. This is another super greenhouse gas, which is less commonly studied due to its relatively weak abundance, but I thought I would include it because it's kind of an interesting looking molecule. We can also put this one into S tier, S for scary. So which chemical is the worst greenhouse gas? Based on global warming potential, sulfur hexafluoride takes the lead with a staggering global warming potential of 25,200. However, if we consider both the global warming potential and the atmospheric concentration, CFCs and HFCs also stand out due to their dual impact on global warming and ozone depletion. An important consideration with these compounds is that they are only the tip of the iceberg. We're trying to change the world one molecule at a time. Sounds like that would take a while. Ooh, you're right. Everyone? three molecules at a time. There are many greenhouse gases emitted from various industries, which combine to form a measurable impact on our planet. Water and CO2 are the main sources of global warming, along with methane and nitrous oxide. But these are chemicals which have been present for as long as our planet has been around. Human activities are filling our atmosphere with new gases which continue to stay for thousands of years. Just because we banned R12 and R134A doesn't mean they'll go away immediately. The abundance of these pollutants has declined slightly in recent decades, but they remain at relatively high levels, showing the lag in progress which is inevitable whenever we make sweeping changes as a species. In conclusion, while CO2 is the most abundant greenhouse gas, other gases like SF6, CFCs, and HFCs have a much higher global warming potential and pose significant threats to our climate. Reducing emissions of these potent greenhouse gases is crucial in our fight against climate change. 
carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions remain to be the main concerns for climate change due to the sheer abundance of these gases. Yet other gases still contribute significantly to global warming. Hopefully this video has taught you a little bit more about global warming than you knew before. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.